Father, we thank you that as we've gathered online that you are speaking, you're reviving hearts, you're calling us again, you're preparing us, you're equipping us and putting tools in our hands to worship, to pray, to stand together so that, Lord, we can count for you and make a difference by allowing your kingdom to come through us. We know you want to speak this morning. We open our hearts once more. Say, Lord, will you speak clear? We are listening in Jesus' name. Amen. The key scripture this morning, and I'm just going to uh, uh, share very shortly (laughs) just uh, a couple of uh, um, enemies of peace and how to hold on to your peace. But our key scripture is from Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. And it says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. And there's so much in this verse that we can um, unpack. But I'm just, as an introduction, want to say that the peace of God is exceptionally powerful. It's exceptionally powerful. God's peace and the God of peace for me is the same thing. Wherever God is, that's where his peace is. And wherever his peace is, is where God is. And so to, to, to have this peace of God in our life at the moment is an incredible, incredible weapon. In fact, it's so powerful that it can crush Satan. Now, the word there is not just move him out the way. It's not just resist him or keep him at bay. The word used is crush, which really means to shatter into pieces. So powerful is the peace of God that it can shatter Satan and the kingdom of darkness. If we, over this time, are able to hold on to our peace, um, the promise here is that God will crush Satan under our feet. Now, again, I want you to notice that Jesus has already crushed Satan. He's already disarmed him. He's already defeated him. But here it says that if you can hold on to that peace of God, then God will bring a personal victory in your life. And, and again, I know we read this scripture sometimes a little bit individually, but the word here, your feet, is actually plural. And uh, this letter of Romans is written to a group of people. It's the church of Jesus Christ. And this is a promise for all of us together. It's not just an individual promise. But if we as the people of God are able to remain in the peace of God, then the personal victory for us is guaranteed. God will crush Satan under our feet. There is that little word soon, which means it's not always immediate. There's that little period between, you know, when we see the victory come to pass and when we have the peace of God. And this is an incredible thing, but we can have the peace of God and the victory can be sure. And between having the peace of God and seeing the victory worked out, there's this grace of God that's on our lives and that is with us to keep us going. So I want to tell you right now to have God's peace in our life. Uh, is a very, very powerful weapon that can overcome whatever the devil throws at us. Of course, you know this um, verse is tucked in between all those greetings that we are working our way through. <clears throat> and so, um, obviously, this is a relational piece. You can see that. Paul is talking here about unity, and in other portions of Scripture, it talks about the bond of peace that we have together. But it's also a mental and emotional peace, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, how that peace of God can guard our minds and our hearts. It's a mental and emotional peace, and it's also a spiritual peace, so it encompasses every area and every part of my life. The second thing I just want to take note of here and show you is um, that, thank you, the Lord just dropped off my bottle through Michael, thank you. <laughs> um, the second thing I want us just to notice here is that 
the source of peace is not necessarily that we understand everything. The source of this peace is not necessarily that all the circumstances are lined up, but the source of peace is the God of peace. And he's often called that in the scriptures, the Prince of Peace, the God of Peace. Um, that's what his name is. And of course, we know from Romans chapter 5, verse 1, that through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. It says, Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe the peace of God is different to just me being at peace with God. It's something God gives me. And Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 clearly says, Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ. And so... This peace of God is a tangible peace that we can experience. It's not just an idea. It's not just a thought. It's not just a desire. We, we can experience it. And it also is beyond anything we can understand. And so we know this peace of God doesn't come by understanding everything. It doesn't come by all the circumstances being lined up. But it comes supernaturally to us. And we know that it also fulfills this function where it guards our hearts and our minds. And so it can protect us. The peace of God can offer protection, um, as we've just read in, in that previous verse that says it can not only crush Satan, but it can protect our hearts and minds against the attack of the enemy. And then the last verse here before we look at what, is, what are some of the enemies of this peace in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, and um, you can say a, a loud amen where you're sitting at home. There's one or two people here shouting amen, the broadcasting team. Second Thessalonians 3, verse 16 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times, and in every way the Lord be with all of you. So we notice here that the difference between the peace of God is not only that it exceeds our understanding, that we can experience it, um, but we see that God himself gives this peace. And we see that it's available to us at all times and in every way. So this is a beautiful, beautiful promise because during this time, I feel like God's been challenging me, Donnie, just Hold on to the peace that I give you. It's a weapon that's able to crush whatever the enemy throws at you. The challenge is, though, that I realize that there is someone who um, understands this principle and is trying his very hardest to separate me from God's peace. And he is the enemy of God's peace. And uh, that's Satan. He, he loves the chaos. He loves the disorder. He loves the panic. He loves the fear. He loves the anxiety. And he uses all kinds of tactics to get me to try and let go of this peace of God because then it makes me vulnerable. And so 1 Corinthians 4.33 says, for example, that God is not a God of disorder but peace. You notice the... Um, What's opposites? I still need people in the room. <laughs> what do you call? Not synonyms. What's it? Antonyms, right? There's like disorder and peace. The Bible uses those two words. The opposite of peace actually is disorder. It's just, it's chaos. And it also says in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 that the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. It's amazing that the kingdom and the government and the order of God doesn't bring res restriction, but actually it brings the peace of God. And so Satan is constantly trying to um, separate me from that peace of God, constantly trying to, to cause a bit of disorder in my life so that I let go that peace of God because it's the very peace of God that will crush him under our feet, if that makes sense. And so <clears throat> I feel like God's reminding us over this time to find that place of peace 
in God that goes beyond our understanding, is not dependent on the circumstances, and to hold on and to remain and to submit to that peace because the victory will be decisive, the victory will be certain, and even if for a while we have to just hold on to the peace of God, the grace of God is with us to carry us to that place where God's going to crush Satan under our feet. So what are some of the strategies that the devil uses to try and force me to let go of that, that place and that position or that stance of, of peace? Number one is strife. And um, I think relational strife is the first part of strife that uh, I would mention. And Proverbs, thank you, Lil is here and he's moving me along because we are online. Proverbs 17 verse 1. He's trying to save you guys data. But anyway... Proverbs 17, verse 1, Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Uh, and Proverbs 20, verse 3 says, It is to a man's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. Now, I don't know how many of you oaks love a crust of dry bread, but this is one of the few scriptures that says it's actually better to have a crust of dry bread than to be in a house of feasting with strife. And so I've realized right now the world is more angry and frustrated than ever before. And, um, you know, there's many things that will cause relational tension. I think the world is trying to get us constantly, um, you know, to pick a side, to divide us, to label us, to brand us, to class us, to categorize us. Are you for or are you against? And so there's all this relational tension and frustration that's spilling out right now. And, you know, sometimes I can just give in to that relational tension. I can vent my anger. I can say certain, I can allow strife to come in. But the thing that I lose is the peace of God. And it's the peace of God that makes my victory sure. So I want to encourage all of us, I don't, we, we can't talk about all the things that can cause, cause relational tension, but what I do know is if we're willing to forgive quickly and completely, it really uh, helps us so much. If we can forgive like Jesus forgave and not hold on to um, offense and those things that sometimes hurt us, it's going to help us not to be in relational strife. Um, Proverbs 13.10 says, Pride only breed quar breeds quarrels. Um, it's not on there, but James 4 verse 1, it says, you know, what causes fights? What causes arguments? Do you think they just happen? No. They come because you want your own way, and deep inside you fight <clears throat> to get your own way. And so when I'm proud, when I want my own way, often it leads to rel relational strife. And that relational strife, I can't hold on to strife and God's peace at the same time. I have to let one go. And I'm saying, man, I'm, I way prefer having God's peace because it sets me up for victory. And so James 3 verse 18 says we should be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, peacemakers who sow in peace and raise a harvest of righteousness. I want to encourage you today. A gentle answer turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up anger. Um, love covers a multitude of sin. Think of all those scriptures, how relationally we can counteract the strife that the enemy is trying to sow at this time. We're those peacemakers trying to sow seeds of peace so we can reap a harvest of righteousness. The second kind of strife is spiritual strife, and I'll just mention it here. There's a couple of reasons why we could be in spiritual strife. And for me, that just means spiritually I'm trying to, too hard in my own strength. And I've got to, over this time, learn to lean into God's strength. Because if I'm spiritually striving, I can't have the peace of God. If I'm trying too hard in my own self, I realize also spiritual strife comes when I want a desired outcome. I want things to work out in a certain way, and I'm trying my level best to get God to do it how I think he should do it, and I can end up in strife. Sometimes it's because we're very capable and able ourselves that it just becomes a habit that I'm relying on myself and not on God for things, and I end up not consulting God and not leaning on God, and I end up in spiritual strife. If my view is too legalistic, I think Mikey mentioned it earlier, I'm always trying to be perfect or please people, I can end up in spiritual strife. 
And if I'm fighting the wrong battles, I'm distracted, and I'm on some cause, um, I can end up just in spiritual strife. How do I counter that? Well, Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he'll show you which path to take. We have to learn to trust God. And, and honestly, for me, over this time, I've, I've had to learn again just to trust in God. It's not our own ability. It's not our strength. We, we, we learn to trust God. And the second thing, and this is for the tennis players. I thought we're always mentioning soccer and everything else, and... Um, Let's mention the tennis players. I don't know if you've played tennis before, but when you're serving, uh, you have to stand behind the baseline at the back. Is that what it's called? Because if your foot is over, it's called a foot fault. No matter how well you serve the ball, and no matter how good that serve is, where you're standing is disqualifying the very serve. And so for me, 1 Peter 5 verse 12 talks about, uh, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you, testifying, this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. I realize that sometimes, you know, I can argue and with all the good intentions, I can be right and all that. But if I'm standing not in the grace of God, if I'm not standing firm in the grace of God, I can be causing spiritual strife. And so for me, this is just so important at this point in time. No matter what decisions people make, let's always make sure we don't stand in the wrong place. We're standing in the true grace of God when we're dealing with people, when we're working with people, when, we, when we're building with people. We're standing in the grace of God. And, um, you know, flesh will always give birth to flesh. Even good-looking, mega-talented, super smooth, super rich, well-abled flesh can still only give birth to flesh. It is only the Spirit of God that can give birth to the Spirit. And so let's stand in the, in the strength of God. And then emotional strife. Uh, I am timing this. We, we, we're going to land soon. <clears throat> but these are enemies. And I've realized, Lord, I have to deal with strife in my life because I can't hold on to strife and the peace of God. And it's the peace of God that passes understanding that's going to give me the victory. Emotional strife comes from grappling with trauma or pain or loss or something that I've grieved, unresolved emotional hurt. And um, I want to say, man, there's a lot of this going around right now as well. I know people are facing big tragedies in their lives. Um, some of you uh, that, that you, you know you're in a place right now where emotionally it's just hard and you're hurting and you're struggling. I, I just know that when these things come, if I hold on to them and I don't deal with them, what I lose is the peace of God, and that's what I don't want to do. And so James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And um, I just want to say, if you never go to someone and talk about some of those things and share some of those things and ask for prayer in some of those things, it's possible for us just to be emotionally um, striving in these areas and wondering, Lord, why am I not getting this breakthrough? All right, so the first strategy that the enemy uses to cause chaos is strife. The second one is anxiety, and these are all slightly different for me, and I just I share these with you not... Like I'm here telling you, these are things I've had to wrestle through over this last season. I feel like this is just so super important for us at the moment to hold on to our peace. Uh, It's going to bring the victory. So anxiety, uh, the world is in a very high level of anxiety at the moment. And another way of saying anxiety is is stress or or worry. And it's a little bit different to fear because it's kind of that consistent um, worry there. And it's because of jobs and businesses and health and the future and children and finances. Amazing what Jesus says in Matthew 13, 22. He says, the one who receives the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word But the worries of this life, it's the same word he uses, the worries or the stress or the anxiety of this life, and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. 
There's a very powerful statement Jesus makes here because if you read that story of the parable, he says the seed is the word of God. And this is the only time that Jesus concedes that there is something that can literally choke the life out of his word. And that is the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. And those things go hand in hand. And so you've got to deal with anxiety. Uh, how do we deal with it? Well, we read Philippians 4, 7 earlier on, but this is really how it starts when you want to experience God's peace. In verse 6, it says, don't worry about anything. So for me, the way I deal with worry is like this. Well, if God commanded me not to worry, he's not going to command me to do something I can't do. I'm just going to obey. That's step one. Don't worry. Um, but then it goes on and says, instead, pray about everything. And wow, for me, I think... Um, <laughs> There's a number of places, the botanic gardens, my parking outside, my room, the beach. There's places where I'm, I'm a walker. And so when I walk, I pray. And I tell you, so much of my worry is resolved in prayer. Prayer is such a key thing. And I've and I said this before, but in this season, friends, our prayer life is so crucial uh, to deal with stress and anxiety. It says, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that he's done. With anxiety, being grateful is, is an antidote, really, for anxiety. I was speaking to Auntie Jen um, the last little while and just saying to her, look back at every single occasion in our lives when we faced a situation where we thought there's no ways I'm going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to get around this. And somehow we sit on this side of that situation. God was able to bring us through. Um, that's his faithfulness. And, and when we begin to thank God for those things, it helps to bring the anxiety levels down. And then lastly, we have to learn how to cast our anxieties on him, 1 Peter 5, 7, because he cares for us. Casting them onto Jesus, and it says, yeah, all your anxieties. No point doing one or two and uh, <laughs> holding on to some. You've got to let go, and you've got to give these over to God. The third in, uh, strategy against the peace of God is unbelief. And uh, your, these, these are things that I, I've honestly, God has been helping me through over the last little while. Mark chapter 9, 24. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now, <clears throat> I was reading the story in Mark again. And you know, this boy was demon-possessed, and uh, the father brought him to the disciples. The disciples couldn't cast out the demons. And then um, Jesus came along, and there was this, this, this story going on. And Jesus asked him, how long has this happened? He said, it's since he's a small child. So you can imagine a very painful situation for a very long period of time, very close to your heart. And then you try and ask others for help, and they can't help you. Sometimes it's just a challenge to stay in a stance, in a position of faith. And, of course, unbelief is the opposite. Um, I think three areas that we, we, we sometimes have unbelief in. One is the love of God. Does God love me when, when I don't feel like it, when the circumstances don't look like it? It's sometimes hard to believe that God still loves us. The promises of God... Um, sometimes when we're in the situation and we know what God's promised and we don't see it happening, it's, it's easy sometimes to, to get into a place of unbelief. And then God's ability. Those are three areas that, that unbelief kind of attacks you. I often confuse my ability with his ability. Nothing is impossible for him. And I love the scripture in Romans 4.20. It says that Abraham did not waver through unbelief. That word Waver it just means to hesitate, to doubt, to withdraw. He didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. If ever there's a time that we need to be strengthened in our faith, where we need to be persuaded about the promises of God, it's now because I cannot hold on to unbelief and have the peace of God. Hebrews 3.19 says they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. If I hold on to those thoughts and I hold on to my unbelief, I can't have the peace of God. And um, so we've got to deal with that. And then the last strategy as we learn this thing is fear. And I'm a, I'm, 
I firmly believe that fear is a feeling. Fear can be a mindset, but fear is also a spirit, and I've come across it a number of times um, in my life. We all do have feelings of fear, but one thing the Scripture is clear on, that we cannot allow ourselves to submit to fear. We can't allow ourselves to give in to fear. And most certainly, if you give fear that free reign, it'll cause chaos in your life. Isaiah 41, verse 13, I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. And so again here, how do I deal with fear? Well, number one, God commands me not to fear, so I'm just not going to give in to fear. That's step number one. But secondly, the question I want to ask you is who's holding your right hand? Because your right hand is the hand that someone takes when they want to lead you. And this scripture clearly says the Lord takes hold of your right hand. Let God lead you, because when God is leading us, um, fear is not leading us. And that's the difference. If you allow fear to take your right hand and lead you, if you're listening to everything that everybody else is saying and all the the negative stuff and you allow that in your right hand, it's going to lead you down that path of fear and you have to resist it. And then um, we know this in 1 John 4, 18. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. And so the way sometimes to not give fear access is to make sure that that space is being occupied by the love of God. Whatever space is not occupied by the love of God makes me vulnerable for fear to stay. And fear can be stubborn as it just digs in. All right, so how do we, how do we receive this peace or how do I, I, I get this peace? Well, number one, Just four little things. Number one, receive it. Psalm 29 verse 11 says, The Lord gives strength to His people, and the Lord blesses His people with peace. You already have it. God has already given us peace. We just have to make sure we receive it. And so when these things happen to me, I go to God and I say, Lord, I know I have your peace. I know I have your presence. I'm just going to be in this position where, Lord, I'm making sure I'm dealing with the strategies of the devil but I'm just going to receive that peace. You bless me with peace. I don't earn it. I don't deserve it. You bless me with your peace. And remember, God's peace is different to our peace. There's not much that can stress out someone who's sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, in full control of everything. That's the peace God wants to bless us with. Secondly, learn to trust Him fully. Um, and I'll throw out these scriptures. Isaiah 26 verse 3. He will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Romans 15, 13, May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. To trust him means I have to let go control. I'm not in control. I, I give control over to him and I trust him. So I receive it. I trust him. I give the Holy Spirit control of my mind. Romans 8 verse 6. For those who don't believe in mind control, here it is in the Bible. The only person we can give control of our mind is the Holy Spirit of God. The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. You know, in every other situation, to surrender is to to acknowledge defeat. But in this case, when I surrender my thought life to the Holy Spirit... It means victory and peace. I've got to let go. I've got to trust. I've got to believe. And as I do that, I receive the peace of God. And the last one um, is allow the peace of God to rule in our hearts. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15. Um, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as member of one body you are called to peace and be thankful So not only do I give my mind over to the Holy Spirit, but I allow the peace of God to come into my heart and rule. That word rule is to govern and to control and to be in charge of my heart. That means my attitude, the way I speak to people, the way I approach problems, the way I deal with things, all of those things I I allow the peace of Christ to come in and rule in my heart. God bless you. Praying for you.